you very much, Taryn, for inviting me. Um, it's a slightly impossibly large topic to cover, really, in one talk. Um, and it's really, I suppose, aimed more at radiology colleagues who perhaps have less of a background in the clinical aspects of the imaging. Um, so if they're, in, if, and they're usually, it's usually about half and half, so any cardiologists in the audience are welcome to go to sleep at this point um, and get your neighbour to nudge you uh, when the talk's over. Oh, why isn't this? Okay, so the, the sort of the three broad areas in coronary disease that I'm going to discuss are patients with stable chest pain syndromes, which may or may not be felt to be angina due to coronary disease, people with acute chest pain syndromes, um, and, and finally, uh, 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 people with heart failure thought to be due to coronary disease. Now, because of the, you know, the, 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 the place that coronary CT sits mostly is in the stable chest pain area. So you'll understand if I speak most about that area. So first of all, a brief word on the pathophysiology uh, of atheromatous coronary disease. Um, you can look at this slide and then instantly forget it. Um, but just briefly, as you know, um, coronary narrowings uh, uh, arise due to the buildup of atheromatous plaque within the wall of the coronary artery. Possibly the initial lesion is, uh, is damaged to the endothelium that allows um, uh, LDL uh, lipoproteins to leak into the wall. Those then attract in macrophages that gobble up the, the fatty stuff. Macrophages form foam cells. They, they uh, secrete... Uh, various chemicals that then attract in smooth muscle cells that also proliferate. And so what you end up with is a great big mess of cells and, and gunge within the wall of the uh, artery. Um, uh, and what happens then uh, really does determine the course that the patient takes. So this is a sort of schematic that shows the different directions in which uh, a given atheromatous plaque could go. So here's your normal artery, and here's your artery where we've got that build-up of atheroma. Now, if that atheroma builds up in a in, in a relentless, progressive way, but but in a controlled way, um, then what can happen eventually is it will progress to a fixed, tight narrowing. And if that narrowing becomes flow limiting then your patient may present with a uh, new onset of, um, uh, of stable angina. It's often not as simple as that, because often these narrowings progress in a stepwise way. So at different points, the given plaque can become unstable. Uh, a bit of clot can form. The artery can go in a stepwise way, become a bit narrower. And then that bit of thrombus um, uh, or platelet aggregation is in integrated into the vessel wall. So the narrowing progresses in a stepwise way, which incidentally is why so much is made of um, rapid assessment of patients with stable angina, but, but of new onset. Because if it's of new onset, the worry is that it actually represents a plaque event and development of a bit of thrombus. And therefore such patients are at higher risk of going on to have an infarct than your patient who's just been walking around with chronic stable angina for years. If that plaque, however, instead of just progressing in a gradual way, uh, becomes unstable, which generally means that the fibrous uh, layer over the top of the fatty rubbish becomes uh, fissured, then that fatty rubbish is exposed to the bloodstream. Platelets will aggregate on it and you've now got an unstable situation. And that can progress in, a, in different directions. Often that platelet aggregation, as I've said, will just be incorporated into the wall and you'll just get a slight increase in, in the narrowing. Sometimes that platelet aggregation will just wash away. The uh, acute lesion will heal and you'll be left in just the same situation as you were before. And that probably happens a, a lot in patients with coronary disease and they don't even know about it. But if that platelet aggregation uh, progresses massively to the extent that the vessel lumen is completely occluded, then you're going to get transmural ischemia of the myocardium, ST elevation on the ECG, and your patient's going to present with an old-fashioned ST elevation infarct. If it progresses to a great extent and you get quite tight narrowing but not full narrowing, then your patient may get anything from uh, unstable angina at rest or on minimal exertion to uh, a non-ST elevation infarct. So 
resting ischemia sufficient to cause myocardial necrosis, but not the full occlusion of the vessel. So a number of different ways in which atheroma can, um, can progress. Now, when we're thinking about stable patients with possible angina, what we're talking about is a patient with a fixed narrowing which will generally not obstruct blood flow at rest, but because the arterioles downstream of it will dilate to maintain resting perfusion. But what, of course, that means is that when the patient tries to exercise, and therefore myocardial oxygen demand increases massively, they are not able to increase their blood supply as much as they would like to. And so you get the potential for supply-demand imbalance to whichever area of the myocardium is subtended by that narrowed artery. And so we get the familiar ischemic cascade that you've probably heard of. So, so at rest, you've not got a problem. Uh, but as the patient exercises, first of all, you will develop uh, a perfusion abnormality. And you'll, then you'll develop, which can be detected on myocardial perfusion scintigraphy or uh, stress perfusion CMR then you'll gradually get differing degrees of left ventricular myocardial dysfunction because the myocardium is not getting enough blood to it and it's becoming ischemic. So first of all, you'll detect diastolic dysfunction, then regional systolic dysfunction that you could detect nicely on a stress echo. And then finally, you get ECG changes and the patient describes angina, which are, of course, the hallmark of the exercise ECG. So progressive increase in changes. So let's think a bit now about patients with stable chest pain, which may or may not be angina. Now, we suffer, unfortunately, from complete overload in the number of investigations available to us now. Um, when I started out, of course, it was very simple. You, you did an exercise ECG on most people, and then you cathed some of them. And you had the exercise ECG, you had coronary angiography, and yes, there was perfusion imaging, which was widely used uh, perfusion scintigraphy with thallium, which was widely used in America, but in this country, uh, certainly at that time, not widely used. It was quite, so it's quite simple, exercise ECG, coronary angiogram. And then, of course, all of these different imaging modalities have caught on. Initially, the functional imaging modalities, starting with uh, perfusion scintigraphy, now done with SPECT, but then with stress echo, stress CMR, stress PET, if you want, and latterly, a way of not just looking at the not looking at the functional aspects of coronary disease, but at the anatomy itself with CT coronary angiography. So trying to make sense now of where all these different investigations sit has become almost impossible, and uh, a great industry, in fact, for guideline writing bodies. Now, just to remind you, uh, this is an old-fashioned coronary angiogram which cardiologists the world over are very comfortable with. Uh, they love to see a normal coronary angiogram. Uh, they, they think there's nothing better than a normal coronary angiogram. And if it's not going to be normal and you've got a nice tight narrowing like that one in the uh, left anterior descending artery, then you can make it go away with an angioplasty and a stent and congratulate yourself that the patient is cured, in inverted commas. But now we've got functional tests as well, and this is the first one that was uh, achieved mainstream. This is perfusion scintigraphy. It's a little bit more sophisticated than it used to be in the 1970s because we've got SPECT, so we could slice the heart in its standard planes. But I think you'll agree with me that this patient clearly has a severe and extensive reversible anteroapical perfusion defect that you see here on these vertical long axis slices. And on the resting scan goes to normal pretty much. So we can be pretty confident this patient's going to have a severe anterior descending uh, stenosis job done. Now you can do the same thing with stress CMR perfusion. You see that nice reversible infraseptal perfusion defect there on the first pass, compared with the late gadolinium scan that shows no infarct. There you see perfusion defect. So same thing, different modality. If you fancy doing a stress echo, you can do that as well. And you can get a nice inducible apical wall motion abnormality with dibutamine or with exercise or whatever you like. So you can get the same sort of functional information uh, uh, with any of these modalities. Um, you can argue with colleagues who do other modalities that your modality is best, but frankly, efforts to show that one modality is better than any other modality 
uh, have been uh, doomed to failure and largely discredited, actually. We, if, I'm not going to get into the argument about spec versus CMR here, uh, but the truth is that the differences between the functional imaging tests are trivial uh, and, and really not as important uh, as the ability to deliver a, a decent quality service in your given hospital. CT is what you're here to learn all about, and this, this is, uh, as you know, it's a very good test. It shows you the anatomy, uh, so the, the coronary anatomy, in a way that you cannot get with the functional imaging tests by definition. Uh, and, and what you see here is a beautiful example of a horrible soft plaque with a critical stenosis in the left main. Okay, so you've got a bewildering array of tests that you could potentially chuck at uh, a patient who's presenting to the chest pain clinic with new onset chest pain. And, and how on earth are you going to decide which test you're going to do? Uh, are you going to do the same test in everybody? Are you going to have a more nuanced approach and pick a particular test in a particular patient? I mean, what are you going to do? So let's try and compare these tests and see where we get to. Um, the functional, so historically, all non-invasive imaging tests were compared against invasive coronary angiography as the gold standard. And, and this, of course, is largely because coronary angiography was the first way of imaging the coronary arteries and therefore essentially was de facto a gold standard. The truth is, however, uh, that is increasingly recognized even by interventional colleagues is that uh, coronary angiography is not a gold standard for anything. It's not a gold standard for luminal stenosis. Uh, because now we've got uh, intravascular ultrasound that will show you uh, what's going on in the wall and the lumen much better. It's certainly not a gold standard for the functional significance of any coronary stenosis, because now they've got pressure wires that allow them to do FFRs and, and interrogate where the significance of a coronary stenosis. So it's a very arbitrary gold standard, but to some extent we're stuck with it. If we compare how the functional tests can, uh, perform against this gold standard, you get results pretty much like this. Here's the exercise ECG, nuclear scans of one sort or another, exercise echo, dibutamine echo. The truth is that you will never get a diagnostic sensitivity of more than 80 or 90 percent with a specificity of about 70 to 80 percent. Now, if that sounds all right when you think 70 80 percent is quite a, a good number, or sorry, 80 to 90 percent is quite a good number. But think about it. If the sensitivity is 80 to 90 percent, that means 10 to 20 percent of people with a normal scan will actually have underlying coronary disease. So it starts to feel a little bit less reliable if you're going to accept quantitative coronary angiography in this case as your gold standard. Which is why CT, superficially at least, seems like a far superior test uh, before you start digging down a bit. Because as you know, as you will already have heard, CT coronary angiography have an, has an absolutely superb sensitivity and negative predictive value, pushing pretty much 100%. If your CT coronary angiogram is normal, your patient does not have coronary disease. Now, of course, it, the positive predictive value and the uh, specificity are slightly less good, um, particularly where calcium is concerned. We often overestimate the severity of stenoses. But nevertheless, as a rule out test for obstructive coronary disease, it can't be bettered uh, as far as non invasive imaging is concerned. But, but is predicting what the coronary angiogram is going to look like really the be all and end all of this? And of course, I would say the answer is no. Um, because patients do not come to chest pain clinics saying, uh, I want to know what my coronaries would look like if I had an angiogram doctor. No, they come saying, I've got chest pain and I want you to make sure that my pain goes away and that I don't die of a heart attack. That's actually what they're coming with. So actually what the angiogram would look like is a rather indirect gold standard. Perhaps more important is prognosis. So what is the ability of these different tests to predict the risk for a given patient? Now, of course, the invasive coronary angiogram is terribly good at doing that. We, you know, it's obvious, isn't it? If you've got unobstructed coronaries with absolutely no uh, irregularity in the lumen, you're going to do very well. 
And then as your coronary angiogram gets more abnormal, your survival curve becomes progressively worse until here you see what happens with free vessel disease, which is not a good thing to have. But the other tests, the other non-invasive tests, and actually in particular the functional tests, are also superb at predicting prognosis. So here's data from thousands and thousands of patients from the Cedar sinai database that shows that as the amount of ischemia on your perfusion scan goes up, the event rate, in this case, your risk of having a non-fatal myocardial infarction, goes up with this pattern. Interestingly, the cardiac death bit of prognosis is better predicted, as you will all remember, uh, by ejection fraction, by left ventricular function. There's, a comp there's an interplay between ischemia and LV function with functional tests, just as, I might add, in the cath lab, there is an interplay between the severity of coronary disease and LV function. So um, you can see that with patients who have no ischemia on their perfusion scan, the event rate per year is well below 1%. So essentially, there is no intervention you could throw at such a patient that's going to reduce the risk further. And therefore, although a patient with a normal functional test may have underlying coronary disease on an angiogram, their prognosis is going to be good in any event. And so you can be reassured from a prognostic point of view, at least for a couple of years. And you could, you can, although, of course, perfusion scintigraphy has been around longer and therefore there's lots of data for it. Uh, and I spend a lot of my time doing it and therefore I'm slightly more enthusiastic about it. You can show pretty much the same result for stress echo and stress CMR. So if stress echo and stress CMR are what you do, good luck to you. It will perform pretty similarly. CT, of course, as, as you'd expect, also is a very good predictor of prognosis, both in terms of the calcium score and in terms of whether there are any uh, luminous stenoses. So uh, 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 Taran in particular is a great enthusiast for the calcium score for, for very good reason. People with a calcium score of zero have a very low event rate. Now, some of them will have obstructive coronary disease due to soft plaque, but even then the actual event rate over, uh, per year is only about 1%. So if you've got a calcium score of zero, your risk is very low and the risk goes up progressively with calcium score. And the same is true for whether you've got obstructive or non-obstructive coronary disease. So here we see, or on the CT, so here we see a set of survival curves very similar to what you've seen, what you've seen with invasive coronary angiographic uh, imaging, and you can see that the more vessels are stenosed on a CT, as you would expect, the worse the prognosis. So all of these things will predict the prognosis very nicely. They all predict whether you're going to have coronary disease to some degree, though admittedly CT is going to be uh, better in terms of ruling it out. So how on earth do you put it together to decide how you're going to manage your patients? Now, if you look around uh, the guidelines from both sides of the Atlantic, you'll see that it's, it's actually a dog's dinner. The data really do not support any particular modality over any other in any given situation. There are very, very few head-to-head -head studies, almost none actually, that inform the debate. And so actually, the, the expert guideline committees get together over a, a, a nice lunch uh, with some after-dinner drinks and possibly a cigar, and they decide how are they going to divvy up the cake between the different modalities. And you get things that look like that. Now, I'm not, this is from the ACC, this is the American guidelines, ACC, AHA, all combined. I challenge you to show that to a nurse in the chest pain clinic and invite her to manage patients based on that. It is just impossible. I mean, actually, when you dig down onto that, and here are the European guidelines that's very, you know, similarly enlightening. When you dig down onto it, actually, it boils down to you could do pretty much anything to anybody uh, if you want. NICE, because, of course, we have a national health service in this country, NICE have tried to make, come up with something unifying and sensible. And they've done a reasonable job. This is their guideline from 2010. And you'll 
hopefully everybody in the room by now will be aware that they pretty much divided the cake into three based on the clinical assessment, the initial clinical assessment of the patient. So the idea is that you assess the patient clinically to start. Do they have typical angina, atypical angina, or non-cardiac chest pain? And that is based on three cardinal features. The type of pain, tight, crushing, pressing, brought on by exertion, number two, and number three, relieved by rest or GTN within five, 10 minutes. To have an typical angina, you have to have all three of those features. To have atypical angina, you have to have two of those three features. And if you've got one or none of those features, you have non-cardiac chest pain. Now here is one of the big problems with all of this. Most of the patients coming through a chest pain clinic are lucky to have one of these cardinal features, let alone two or three. So the majority of people coming through the system don't have angina at all. Even if they turned out to have coronary disease on imaging, their chest pain is still probably not cardiac. And of course, these guidelines in practice are never implemented as intended, okay? Lots of people with what NICE will regard as non-cardiac chest pain, who therefore officially should not be investigated for coronary disease, end up being investigated through this path, these pathways. Because the second bit of the clinical assessment is the assessment of pretest probability, which is based on age, sex, risk factors, etc. So you take the typicality of chest pain, the pretest probability, and you then work out how you're going to investigate them. Now, patients with a less than 10% pretest probability of coronary disease or a greater than 90% pretest probability of coronary disease are regarded as not having coronary disease or definitely having coronary disease before you begin and therefore are not covered in these guidelines. People between 10 and 30% pretest probability should be investigated through a CT pathway. People at intermediate probability, which is to say 30 to 60%, are investigated with functional imaging. And people at greater than 60%, 60 to 90% pretest probability, get, go straight to the cath lab for an invasive angiogram. The assumption being that they're at such high probability of having obstructive coronary disease that you might as well save money, time and effort and take them straight to the cath lab, find the stenosis and stent it. And the problem with that, actually, is that our ability to assess pretest probability turns out to be absolutely hopeless. Most of these, the, mo the model, it's all based on sort of Diamond and Forrester uh, assessment, the typicality of chest pain, the, the risk factors, etc. All based on a selected population of people coming to coronary angiography. So immediately boosting the background prevalence of coronary disease. And, the, and so not surprisingly, when you look at a large CT population, and this is from the confirmed registry, you can see that regardless of symptoms, regardless of age, regardless of sex, the observed prevalence of obstructive coronary disease on CT, black bars, is something like a half to a third what the traditional scoring models predict, which means that if you apply the traditional Diamond Forrester approach to the NICE guidelines, your 60 to 90% pretest probability group in reality is probably only about you know, 20, 30 to 50. So actually the patients, all your patients are at much lower risk than you thought they were, which of course throws into doubt the, um, uh, the basis on which the decisions to recommend one imaging modality over another were based. <laughs> Recognizing that and some other data that's come out on CT, NICE have recently been engaged in a process of reevaluating their guideline, which, which I've been involved in. There are a number of problems with that review of the guideline, and not least of which is they have not been able to go back to the whole uh, premise of the guideline, which is the ability to predict coronary anatomy on an angiogram. They weren't allowed, they're, they're not allowed to consider prognostic studies. In fact, the only studies they've been allowed to consider for any modality have been studies where everybody's had an angiogram 
and there's an angiographic gold standard, which immediately cuts out some of the most compelling studies in the literature, particularly regarding prognosis, etc. Anyway, nevertheless, allowing for all of that, the nice when this is now has been out for review and is due to become law, I believe, law, due to become official. Uh, around about now, actually, the, the reason it's, there's been such a delay is because they've also been re-evaluating the acute recommendations for acute chest pain, which are part of the same guideline document. So, but that's been done by two separate committees at NICE. So the, the stable uh, guidelines were, were finished with months ago. The acute bit of the guideline is, has been much delayed. And so there have been umpteen different versions of the guideline out for review, and it's been very confusing for people. But this is what they're going to recommend for stable chest pain. Offer CT coronary angiography. If clinical assessment indicates typical or atypical angina, or maybe they've got non-anginal chest pain, but they've got a slightly worrying looking ECG. So essentially, anybody with angina and I mean angina, I don't mean all comers to the chest pain clinic with chest pain, which is, is the worry, because suddenly everybody in the country with chest pain needs a CT, if you adopt that view. We're talking specifically about people with angina. Remember, those three cardinal features, you need two or three of them. Anybody with angina gets a CT as the first line test. And you can't get an easier guideline than that. You then reserve functional imaging for patients where the CT angiogram has shown coronary disease of uncertain functional significance. So, you know, people with the, the 50 to 70% stenosis, is it or isn't it? It's flow limiting. Or people with a, a non-diagnostic CT for whatever reason, maybe for some reason, uh, heart rate control was impossible and it was a dog's dinner of a scan. Maybe there's so much calcium that you couldn't, you couldn't exclude coronary disease, whatever it might be functional imaging for people where you're not sure based on the CT. And then you offer invasive angiography as a second line investigation when the results of non-invasive functional imaging are inconclusive. So that tiered approach. CT, and then after the CT alone, you may have your answer, normal or significant stenosis. Functional imaging for people where the CT is not quite sure. And I, although I spend most more of my time doing functional imaging than I do CT, I can quite happily live with that because I think we're not going to go short of patients to have to do functional imaging in. There's going to be a lot of people who are coming through with iffy CTs who you're not going to want to cath, you're not quite sure, is the chest pain really angina? We're going to do functional imaging on them. And I tell you, there's nothing easier to report than a nuclear perfusion scan where you already know pretty much what the anatomy is from the CT. So um, I, I can live with this. As long as it's implemented, and as, as it says, and CT for angina, not for everybody with chest pain. If you, if you want to start CTing people with a bit of chest pain here, doctor, but they happen to be a diabetic, then you're on your own. You're outside of this guideline. You might be right to do it in certain circumstances, but don't think that it's part of the NICE guideline. So are you asking questions? Simple questions. Um, yes, the changes in non-dynamic. Thing is, um, is there a role for simply passive scoring before the CPCA or just very... Okay, um, that's very, both very good questions. Um, the, I mean, clearly for patients presenting with chest pain that's a bit worrying and dynamic ECG changes, then that patient may well flip into the acute bit of the guideline. So that, so we're talking here about, you know, the patients with fixed, bit of fixed T inversion, an ECG that isn't quite normal. As regards the calcium score, that's very that's a talk in itself and it's something that i've had some good natured discussions with taryn about who has very good data that suggests that a calcium score of zero pretty much excludes obstructive coronary disease and therefore you could save doing a lot of ct angiograms if you relied on a calcium score of zero there are there are arguments on both sides the argument that the nice committee went with was that generally we book most places will book people a slot for a CT coronary angiogram and it's inconvenient to book a calcium score, send them away, bring them back for the angiogram. <coughs> now, I'm not going to put words in his mouth, but Taryn will say, well, it's, so, it's very easy to do a calcium score. You can whip them in and out. So why not do that and then 
bring them back for the angiogram if you have to. Or argue that actually you do so few angiograms, in fact, that you might as well just go ahead and do it anyway. It, it, it's a, that's an argument that has merit. The other argument is that some people could have a severe soft plaque stenosis causing angina, even though the calcium score is zero. Now, but there's some debate about that in the literature. It's possibly best if you're going to cover that, presumably, Nobody at some point. Does. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's contentious. Tarrant's data from Harefield is actually quite compelling that the, the prevalence of significant soft plaque stenosis in people with a calcium score of zero is pretty negligible. Other studies have been a bit less uh, definite about that. Um, this, is a de this is a debate. I think if in your hospital you set up a service that used a calcium score of zero as a as a risk stratifier, and you chose not to do CT chronogeography on people with a calcium score of zero, I think that would be entirely defensible within your service, actually. Um, nice, have, have, I mean, now this is a guideline. It's not a, uh, this is not a rule. So I think you can tailor the guideline for your own purposes. It, but it's a, it's a debating point. Okay, so um, now, Okay, so NICE has gone very firmly with CT for everybody, functional imaging to, to sort out a few stragglers, if you like. <coughs> the truth is, there's actually very little evidence for that. I mean, it's neat and tidy and easy for chest pain clinic nurses, but we have to recognise that there's not very much data to support it. Here is a very lovely head-to-head -head study comparing anatomical testing with CT versus functional testing mostly with perfusion scintigraphy, because it's an American study, mostly with perfusion scintigraphy. A few patients had exercise ECG only, a few had stress echo. But basically, it, it, it's more or less a comparison of CT with nuclear. And, and then the patients were managed in standard fashion. And you can see that the survival curves of a very large population, 10,000 patients in all, the survival curves are completely superimposable. No difference. And the quality of life of the patients, because of course it's not all about survival, it's also about living a normal life, not worried, not having angina. The survival uh, as well, at any time point from six months, 12 months, 24 months, um, 24 months obviously two years, there is absolutely nothing to choose between function and CT in terms of angina frequency, quality of life score, whatever. So the evidence actually that one strategy is better than another strategy is lacking. We could get better, we, but we can, we can move beyond all of this. This idea of that, you know, it's, it's anatomy versus function or whatever is, is, is old news. This was out of date in the 1980s and yet NICE are still running with it. Because we know that it's not just about anatomy and it's not just about function. It's about an interplay between the two. Yeah, you can have a non-flow limiting coronary stenosis, but you're still at higher risk of an infarct going forward than someone who has completely normal coronary disease. Equally, you can have a normal, uh, you can have a, 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 a normal perfusion scan and, you know, you can, you can have, so I'm getting confused in my language here. You can have a normal one and an abnormal other, or both abnormal, or both normal, and they tell you different things. Here is a, um, a lovely study. This is anatomy. This is uh, invasive anatomy. Diameter stenosis of something like 4,000 lesions compared with fractional flow reserve by functional significance with a pressure wire. And you can see it's just a splodge, okay? Of course it's true. But as the stenosis severity gets worse, the fractional flow reserve goes down. So yeah, stenosis severity goes, gets worse, fractional flow reserve goes down. So of course, there's a sort of tendency for it to look like that. But there's plenty of people with a stenosis of greater than 50% who have normal uh, function. And, and, a lot of, and a significant number of people with a stenosis severity of less than 50% who actually have abnormal function. 
So anatomy and function tell you different things and that you cannot easily predict one from the other. You'll be aware of the FAME study that actually looked at uh, a, 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 an interventional strategy um, uh, based solely on the angiogram versus an interventional strategy based on the angiogram backed up with pressure wire study to look at the functional significance of the stenosis. And actually, on any endpoint parameter, people with the pressure wire guided angioplasty strategy did better with fewer stents and lower cost. <coughs> you can replicate that sort of data non invasively too. You can do either hybrid CT and SPECT perfusion imaging. Uh, either two scans done at separate sittings on separate scanners and then combined, or done on the same spec CT scanner, which very few people do. And you can see that, the, in, if, and here we're talking about the ability to predict or exclude a pressure wire positive coronary stenosis, yeah? And you can see that the combination of CT and spec gives you far higher sensitivity specificity positive and negative predictive value than either test alone. And similarly, in prognosis, people with, here's people with normal CT and normal perfusion scan, they do very well. Here's people with abnormal CT and abnormal perfusion scan, they do very badly. Here's people with one normal and one abnormal, they do something in the middle. So they're both telling you different things. So very briefly, um, that, that's basically the talk. <coughs> that's where the role of functional imaging actually lies. But there are some other areas. What about people with acute chest pain? Well, acute chest pain management now is driven by um, uh, the cath lab, and quite rightly. If you've got someone coming in with a ST elevation myocardial infarction, there's no time to bugger about with functional imaging or CT or whatever. You take them to the cath lab, because every minute that you mess about is a minute more of myocardial damage. If you've got someone with a non-ST elevation in, infarct, high troponin, etc., typical chest pain, again, you know what's going on. You need to do an angiogram and, 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 and sort them out. So really, the role of imaging in this group is on the, on the peripheries. Some people present with a, a history of chest pain, but without definite ECG changes, maybe without a definite troponin release. Perhaps they've got a bit of atypical chest pain. They turn out to have pneumonia. The troponin's gone up a bit. You don't want to cath all these people. There may well be a role for imaging in the exclusion or confirmation of an acute coronary syndrome. And also there will be some people who have had a proven ACS who for some reason either haven't had an angiogram up front or have had an angiogram and an angioplasty, but there's some bystander disease left that they want to know about. There's evidence for the first group, early exclusion of uh, coron acute coronary syndrome. Uh, there's data from the nuclear literature that says you can give them a quick injection of sestamibi or whatever takes your fancy, uh, as long as the pain has gone away only within the last hour or two. And a normal scan pretty much excludes coronary disease or pretty much excludes an acute coronary syndrome. And there is evidence that that can lead to enhanced and more rapid discharge from hospital. There's also very nice data from the CT literature, which is perhaps more practical because it's unlikely that you're going to have uh, syringes full of sestamibi knocking around in the emergency department late at night. And this Romicat 2 study showed very nicely that people with CT were discharged um, um, uh, many hours earlier than people in the standard group. So you can use CT in that regard. For people who you're wanting to interrogate after uh, an angiogram uh, or, uh, or angioplasty, it, we're really talking about functional imaging by definition because you already know what the anatomy is. And here, perfusion imaging can be very useful. Here's a lady who had an angioplasty to her right coronary after a non-STEMI and she had some residual circumflex and PDA disease. And you can see quite nicely, she had a reversible lateral perfusion defect here, which is most likely probably to be in the circumflex territory. I'm not going to talk about that. There is some interest as well in uh, hot plaque imaging. Yeah, because the one thing we haven't been very good at doing, we can look at anatomy, anatomy we can look at 
physiology, we can't really tell you how stable the plaque is. And there may be a role for fluoride PET in this regard, which is something being pursued by the Edinburgh group. This is not yet ready for prime time, but you can see here that F, uh, fluoride lights up this hot plaque. And finally, what about people at the end of their coronary journey who have ended up with a knackered left ventricle? Well, there are two roles for imaging in that regard. First of all, the patient presenting with heart failure, well, you're not quite sure that they've got coronary disease or not, and you want a non-invasive test to avoid cathing them. And then you've got the patient who you know has got ischemic LV dysfunction, but you want to know whether there's going to be merit in revascularizing them, the, the hibernating myocardium story. Well, here's a patient you know, with heart failure, query cause, and there's no doubt that this patient has had a massive anthroapical and septal infarct. So this is due to, it's occluded his LAD proximally. He's, he's infarcted most of his LV. Uh, this is clearly going to be uh, uh, heart failure caused by coronary disease. But in this regard, using functional imaging to rule out coronary disease in people presenting with heart failure is fraught with risks. Here's another patient presenting with heart failure query cause and never had a day's chest pain in his life and was a consultant anaesthetist to boot. Always a bad thing. This is a thallium scan and you can see, yes, a dilated left ventricle, but pretty much uniform uptake of tracer throughout the myocardium on both the stress and the resting scan. But of course, things being the way they are, he had critical proximal coronary disease. And of course, this is one of those rather unusual situations of balanced multivessel ischemia. Now, there is a lot of data in that scan. That scan shows that this myocardium is all alive and therefore might well respond to revascularization. So there's a lot of information in that scan, but only when you know what the anatomy is. To use that scan to predict the anatomy is fraught with danger. And I think CT is perfectly placed for this indication. Because in the patient with heart failure, which may or may not be due to coronary disease, it is not subtle. Either the CT is going to be pretty well normal, in which case it's game over. You could be very confident that patient does not have heart failure due to coronary disease, or it's going to be a dog's dinner, and you can be pretty confident that it is due to coronary disease. And then, of course, you've got the genuinely difficult people in the middle who've maybe got a bit of coronary disease that isn't enough to explain the heart failure, and that's because there are two things going on. And the Diagnostic accuracy of CT in this situation is very good. And finally, the hibernating myocardium story. And this, of course, is the province of functional imaging rather than CT, because by definition, you know the anatomy and you want to know whether the myocardium is alive or not. And of course, you'll be aware that there is a subset of patients with ischemic LV dysfunction where the myocardium is not all infarcted. There are areas which would like to contract more vigorously but are prevented from doing so because of their exhausted um, uh, uh, vasodilator reserve. So though such myocardium has impaired function, but is alive on whatever uh, criterion you're, of imaging you're using, and has some marker of impaired blood supply. And there are a bewildering number of investigations you could do for this. <laughs> far more investigations, far more literature on these investigations than there is any evidence that any of it makes any difference. Here's a couple of nice examples. This patient had occluded his left main stem and had infarcted almost all of his left coronary territory. And this is all, this is just a resting scan. This is all right coronary territory. There is no point in revascularizing that man's left main stem because it's dead. On the other hand, here's a patient with also with, with three vessel coronary disease, resting scan there, stress scan there. And you can see that just from the back of the room, most of the myocardium is taking up tracer at rest, part perhaps from the apex. And then with stress, there is additional uh, ischemia in the lateral wall. So this patient will benefit, or in theory, will benefit from revascularization. Trouble is, the, there is very poor endpoint data 
You'll be aware of the STITCH trial that attempted to randomise people to medical therapy versus bypass surgery and drew a blank. But there are set, and, and in fact, when they looked at the viability story, they showed that it made no difference whether you had viability or not viability, medical therapy versus bypass surgery, no difference. But there have been a lot of criticisms of this study because their assessments of viability were haphazard and inconsistent and rubbish. Tantalizingly, they've now followed these patients up for 10 years and they've started to see a benefit of revascularization over medical therapy. So it may be that the story is for patients where you're revascularizing for heart failure, they've got to survive the initial year or two to get the benefit. And we don't yet know how the viability story plays out there. So that's the talk. Um, although this has been very much based on imaging, I hope I've given you some insight into the fact that actually imaging is no substitute for clinical common sense. If you blindly apply guidelines to patients where the guidelines don't apply, you're going to run into serious trouble, particularly with the new NICE guideline. So if you take nothing else away from this talk, take away the fact that NICE is talking about angina, not about all comers with chest pain. So when they say CT is the first line test, it's for angina, not for all comers with chest pain. If you start sending all comers with chest pain to the CT scanner, then people like Taryn and myself are going to be completely overwhelmed. Now, we might quite like that because it will, it will drive business cases for hundreds of CT scanners, but we're going to be doing an awful lot of rather pointless normal scans. Okay, thank you very much.